All right. Uh, yes, the monotone convergence theorem. This is about um, sequences which are bounded. As we know, bounded does not necessarily imply convergence, right? Bounded in general does not imply convergence. That's because, for example, minus 1 to the n is bounded but doesn't converge, right? It, uh, it actually, the word is diverges. I don't think I've ever said that word before, but the, the, op, the opposite of converges is diverges. Uh, diverges does not mean that it goes to infinity necessarily. It just means it doesn't converge to any particular number. Anyway, negative 1 to the n is bounded because all the absolute values are either plus 1 or minus 1, but it does not converge. It diverges. All right? It. Um, but... As I was saying last time, actually there are some cases in which bounded will imply convergence if you also assume some other stuff. And uh, it is a fact that bounded and increasing, actually this one does imply convergence. And that's basically what the monotone convergence theorem says. I'm going to write this more formally in a moment. Bounded and increasing does imply convergence. And just I'm going to try and convince you of that just on a picture or something. Bounded, remember, means there's some value, say, big M, where this sequence never goes to the right of the big M. And then uh, let's, uh, I'll draw some, some points here. Increasing means each dot I draw has to be to the right of the ones to the left. Dot, 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 dot. They have to keep on increasing every time, but they're not allowed to go past the M. Does it seem to you reasonable to say, in that case, they're going to have to converge? In the, like, in the worst case, you might say they, they're going to just bunch up and eventually converge at M. Or maybe they could have converged somewhere else, like to the left of M. They could, for some reason, bunch up right over here and then converge to something right there, right? But they cannot diverge. Um, diverging would have to they'd have to maybe like go back and forth in some way in order to not converge. These values are going to have to lump up uh, at some specific point, maybe at M or maybe somewhere else to the left of M. All right. So it is true that bounded and increasing implies convergence. And actually the same is true if it was decreasing every time, because bounded always means bounded in absolute value. So it means it has an upper bound and also a lower bound. And if it decreases towards the lower bound, then that also will mean that it has to converge. All right, so really the monotone uh, convergence theorem is not just about increasing, it's about any sequence which is either increasing or de decreasing. So let's let's talk some specifics here. We say an, here's the definition, an, the sequence is increasing when uh, an is let me make sure I don't get it backwards. A n is less than or equal to a n plus 1 for all n. All right? Or you could say a n plus 1 is greater than or equal to a n. A n is less than a n plus 1. That means each one is less than the next one, or possibly equal. Some books will call this uh, some books will call this non-decreasing because I said less than or equal. And they would use the word increasing to mean actually strictly less than every time. But in our textbook, it says increasing means this. Uh, so it is actually possible if some of the terms are equal to one another, that still counts as increasing, even if, even if they don't strictly increase every time. All right. And then decreasing is similar. And is decreasing when a n is greater or equal to an plus one for all n. Right? Each one is bigger than the one that follows it. That's called decreasing. Yeah. Yes, if your sequence was just a, the same number over and over, yeah, that is increasing and is also decreasing. Yeah. 
that's a little weird. But yes, a, se a constant sequence is both increasing and decreasing. Yeah. It's true. It's like later on, we'll, we're going to talk about the fact that it's possible for a set to be open and closed. These words don't always act the way you want them to act. Yeah. But that that is on, that only happens for a constant sequence, which we we don't focus on those all that much. Uh, anyway, this word monotone, we say a n is monotone. The word monotone, like in ordinary English, means something like it's the same every time, or like always does the same thing, something like that. Monotone when it is increasing or decreasing. Right? So when I say monotone, that either means it always increases or it means it always decreases. Um, this is the word monotone. All right, and then the theorem, the monotone convergence theorem, I'll write it down here. This is a big deal, very important, although it's not really hard to, to see why it's true. The monotone convergence theorem. This, I believe, is listed by name in the syllabus. So if you're if you're checking off the syllabus, uh, big list of things you've never heard of in the syllabus, this is one of the one of the first ones. The monotone convergence theorem. It says, if a n is monotone and bounded, then it converges. That's the monotone convergence theorem. If a n is monotone and bounded, then it converges. So this applies to a sequence which is increasing, and it also applies to a sequence which is decreasing. That's what monotone means. All right. Um, one interesting thing about this is this is one way you can prove that a sequence converges even if you don't know what it converges to. Like in all the examples we've done so far, to show something converges, you have to first figure out what the value is that it converges to, and then you prove that it converges to that value. Um, you have to know what it's converging to, though, before you can actually demonstrate with the epsilons and all that. But uh, if you know the monotone convergence theorem, actually does not, you can apply this without knowing what the uh, limit of the sequence is, which is, is helpful sometimes. All right, monotone and bounded, then it converges. Okay, I want to do the proof of this. It's not so difficult, actually. And then we'll talk about something uh, something a little different. Um, I would like to talk about this in terms of, uh, well, first I'll start by saying, like, let's assume that AN is monotone and bounded. Now, monotone could either mean increasing or decreasing. It turns out the proof goes really the same way either way. So I'm just going to say, um, assume this is a, a buzzword that you see sometimes in mathematical proofs. Without loss of generality, that a n is increasing. Without loss of generality means uh, I'm going to assume it's increasing. Now, it could have also been decreasing, but the whole proof is going to be the same that way, too. So I'm just going to do it one way, and uh, you can uh, you can fill in the details yourself if you want to do it the other way also. All right. Assume without loss of generality that a n is increasing. For a decreasing, basically everything is the same. You just change all the change the direction of all the inequalities. All right. Uh, we assume that it's increasing, and also assume that it's bounded, right? A n is bounded, and what that means is so there's just some big M, a real number, with a n an absolute value less than big M. All right. This is. Uh, this is our setup. And now I have to explain why it converges. So um, for converging, you know, like I said before, what's, what's kind of immediately tricky about this is we don't know what it converges to. So how are you going to show that thing with the epsilons? Like we have to show that, you know, the thing about a n minus a is less than epsilon for any epsilon. But we don't even know what the a is. So we have to think a little bit about what does it converge to. And, um, well, what does it converge to? If my sequence is bounded, say M, 
Uh, and I'm going to draw the picture just imagining that it does converge. It, that means it looks something like this. Now it might not actually converge to the M, but it, I'm drawing it as if it sort of converges to something right there. All right. Whatever it converges to has to be to the left of the M. So these, these uh, points over here, these are the AMs. Maybe that's A1, A2, whatever, right? This is what it converges to, I'll call it A. But the, the big question is like, what is A in any kind of, um, uh, I mean, as far as the proof, we have, to, we have to demonstrate that A really is the limit. Um, actually, there is another way that we can express what A is. What exactly is A in terms of the sequences, the sequence terms, right? I mean, just the way that I drew the picture, A, you could write it this way, A is the limb, the limb of uh, the sequence. But I don't want to say that just because the whole point of the proof is that I'm trying to demonstrate that the limit exists, right? That it that it converges to something. So um, you can't call it the limit. Actually, there's another thing, though. Uh, at least it looks the way in this picture. That a is is some other. There's another way to describe what a is on this picture. Do you have an idea? It's another kind of. Thing that we talked about, we actually talked about this before we talked about limits. Yeah, yeah it looks like the soup of those dots, doesn't it? It is, um, I mean, that's what it looks like to me, right? So I'm gonna, this is, this is like the beginning of the proof it requires you to somehow figure out what the A is. In this case, it is the soup. It better be the soup, all right? So I'm gonna say, let A equal the soup of the ANs. I put just my my notation just to be uh, to be correct about it. I, I put this the, the squiggly brackets around the AN. That's because I'm I'm thinking that the AN's as a set because that's what you take the soup of. You take the soup of a set. All right. In this case, the limit of the sequence is the same as the soup. That's usually not true. That's only because the sequence is increasing, right? Because that, that's why the limit is the soup. Or, ordinarily, a sequence which doesn't just increase all the time, its limit will not be the same as the soup. But in this case, it is. Um, remember, this whole proof is in the case that AN is increasing. If I was instead doing the decreasing one, what would I use? I wouldn't use the soup then, because the points would go off to the left. Then what, what would we do instead? Yeah, then I would use the imp, which is like the soup, but on the other side. All right, so. That's the difference. If you do the proof use, uh, using decreasing instead of increasing, use the imp, and you switch around all the inequalities. Then. All right, anyway, let this be the soup of n, and then we'll show that a n converges to a, which is you know that soup. Uh, and actually, for the purposes of this proof, I think it's a little easier to show that kind of um, what I called the other day the topological version. So I'm going to show that. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists the n such that um, n bigger than the big N implies that. Uh, here, here's where I'm going to write it sort of more topologically. A n is in the epsilon neighborhood around A. I hope you remember what that means. This v epsilon means the um, the small interval around A uh, of radius epsilon. So this set, if you were to like on my picture, if A is here, then this set is, it goes up to A plus epsilon and it goes down to A minus epsilon. That's the set V epsilon of A. Is that a question? What happens uh, for all, is that an N? Like N greater than zero? Here? No, it would be the same thing that For all epsilon greater than oh, zero? Yeah, sorry, oh, that's, a, that's a squiggly. Squiggly epsilon. All right, that's the definition. That's the definition of convergence. Okay, but this actually we can we can uh, we can do this without much problem. Like if you look at that picture again, 
So then I just draw, drew a little version of that, but let's say this is A, and then my terms here. Now, what do I need to demonstrate is that eventually all of the terms of this sequence end up inside this little window here, the, in the red zone, right? Eventually, all of the terms end up in the red zone. Um, because this A is the soup, I can tell you, I don't know if you remember this, this is one of our, one of our old theorems about the soup. It said that if A is the soup and you go to the left even a little bit, that means that there are some points from the set in this, in this little window. Right? That's what it means to be the soup. If you push it to the left a little bit, then you're going to pass over some of those points. So I will say, since A is the soup, A is um, you know, soup of AN. That means at least one of those points actually is in that little window there, all right? One of them is. Um, would you mind if I call it, I'll say one point, let's say A sub big N. It could be like A5 or something. Like one, just one of them is in there. That's what I'm going to call the big N. We have to choose what the big N is. This is what I'm going to call the big N. A N is in this, interval, uh, this neighborhood, the epsilon of A. That's by that theorem about the soup that said, you know, S is the soup if and only if for all epsilon, um, there's some element of the set greater than S minus epsilon, right? Since A is the soup, there is one point, I meant to say, there, is, there exists one point, A N. Really, that's not good enough to show that it converges to A. We have to demonstrate that all of the other sequence points are still in this region. Can anybody explain why that is? If one of them is there, what about all the other ones? Are they, do they go back over here? First of all, can, can they go back that way, the next one? No, why not? Yeah, because our sequence is increasing, they don't go back this way. Maybe, could they go all the way out to the right? Like past the set to the right? Nope, you say why not? No, because A is the soup, so they can't go past A on the right. So that's, that's the rest of the argument. So, since there's one point AN, which is in that neighborhood, um, I will say if N is bigger than this big N, like the ones further down, um, AN is not less than A minus epsilon, since the AN is increasing, right? And I also, so that means it can't go off to the left. I also need to describe why it can't go out to the right. It's because A is the soup. And I will say A N is not uh, more than A plus epsilon. Actually, it's not even more than A. But I'm, I'm just trying to argue why it remains inside this little set here. A N is not more than A plus epsilon since a is the soup of all the ANs. So A is an upper bound. So none of these points can go to the right of A. All right? And so what that means, so AN is an element of this interval, A minus epsilon to A plus epsilon, which is the epsilon of A, as desired. All right. Yes. Yeah, that's the old the old theorem about the soup, which is since A is the soup, that means if we if we push just to the left even a little bit, we will pass over some of the points in the set. And so going to the left by epsilon means there there is a point that you passed over. Yeah. There's a point in between. That was a theorem. I mean, we it's in the notes. We used it on the homework once, I think. Theorem something point something one point three point something. I don't remember. It's in the book. And we talked about it. All right. This is the end of that proof. Like I said, we did this for increasing. Same thing works for decreasing. You just use the hints instead and you you, you say all the inequalities the other way around. All right. Any, uh, any questions about that? Excellent. Um, <laughs> All 
All right, I just decided to skip over a little something. Um, what I would like to talk about next, this is the monotone convergence theorem. Actually, I think I don't want to skip over what I was going to skip over, because it's interesting. Uh, I want to talk about a uh, some uh, sort of a little application of the monotone convergence theorem. Yeah, is um, can we talk very briefly about series? This is not going to be a big topic for us uh, at the moment, but um, remember, a sequence is a bunch of numbers. Uh, just one after another in a list. A series, anyone remember what series means? It's different from sequence. We haven't talked about series yet, but I'm sure you did in, in your calculus class. Yeah, right. A series is a sum of a sequence. It's uh, like an infinite sum. You add them all up. So a series is um, something like, you know, uh, we would typically write them like something like this. Like that's a series, right? You add up all the terms for something like the sum n equals one to infinity, one over n squared, right? That's a series. Um, what what does it really mean to add together infinitely many things? You should you should have some amount of skepticism about this. Can you even add together infinitely many things? Does that make any sense at all? I actually saw a tweet about this when I got up this morning. I get like recommended tweets about math. There are there are lots of math tweets out there. And a lot of them, there are good ones and there are bad ones. The, the bad ones are like, um, like, are you smarter than a fourth grader? And they're like, do you know how to do this? And you're like, uh, yeah, I guess I know how to do that. Although, like, it's always like some, I don't know. This, this is a bad math tweet because there's always some kind of, uh, usually the person who posted it presenting themselves as like a, as like a true mathematical expert who knows the answer to this. Whereas my, I do consider myself a, a true mathematician, and my feeling about this is like, all right, if, if you have some kind of list of exactly what the rules are, then you do the rules, and that's what the answer is. But it, there's, not, there's no like truth or beauty or anything interesting about that at all. Um, and uh, the one I saw today, this was this morning, it was, um, it was like this, add up the numbers. from zero to one. What's the answer? The real numbers. I think they said real numbers. Add up the real numbers from zero to one. And then it said, now add up the real numbers from negative uh, 0.5 to one. You get this, what's the relationship between the two answers? Anyone have a feeling about this? This is not even what I was going to skip. This has nothing to do with anything. But. Uh, here's, here's one answer that I saw. Add up the real numbers from 0 to 1. That's this. Which, if you know something, this is a half. Of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I saw that. I thought that can't possibly be right, but then I, I, want, I had to wonder to myself, what's wrong with that? It's definitely wrong. I mean, you add all the numbers from zero to one, you get an answer that's less than one. That one half what? Yeah, like one half is already one of those things, and there's many things that are bigger than that. That can't actually add up to one half. What's wrong with this is um, the integral. We sometimes think of the integral as somehow like adding up together, you know, Riemann sum or whatever. But when you're doing the Riemann sum, you are adding, um, you're adding the product of each number times like the width of that rectangle, which is basically zero. It's it's more like, um, it's more like you're you're adding all those numbers together, but then you're also somehow like dividing by infinity or something, or dividing by by zero or something like that. 
the the integral this is just a this is just a red herring that's i mean it is true that that integral is a half but that's not that has nothing to do with the question at hand the I'm, the answer is you, you can't do that i mean you could say the answer is infinity maybe or something like that but this is just asking asking you to add up infinitely many things in fact uncountably many things um there's no guarantee that that has an answer and in this case i would say it doesn't have an answer unless you say it's infinity or something <coughs> and i feel the same way about this one this, this also is, uh, has no answer but um the tweets are full of people who are absolutely sure of what the answer is and um like like this somebody said very confidently that as the answer which it, it took me a while to think that through to decide why it has nothing to do with the integral um but uh yeah, lots of bad responses, in my opinion. Um, anyway, I'll, I, this I was reminded just because when I say this, you should you you have to wonder like what do you even mean by that? Adding together infinitely many things. But uh, this is something I assume you've heard of this before. So like there there is some way. Um, there basically is not a way to add together uncountably many things. Uh, there there are some very far out. Um, con conceptualizations of that but we're not going to go uh, we're not going to try to do anything like this but adding together countably many things is quite a bit easier so I will just tell you if I have a sequence like this then this series is the definition of that what it means this is defined as the limit it's limb uh, as n goes to infinity, I'm saying n there just because I'm, I'm about to have sort of two different variables. It's that limit. You um, you add up to a certain point. So another way of writing this is it's equal to the limit of this sequence. A1 and then A1 plus A2 and then A1 plus A2 plus A3, etc. Right. As you continually add more and more terms to the end, does that actually approach something? Maybe this sequence doesn't have a limit. Maybe it goes to infinity. Maybe it somehow oscillates, which is possible. But if it does have a limit, that's what you call the value of the series. It is this this kind of limit. All right. Um, these things, these individual things, are called the partial sums. The partial sums, right? Each one represents a small piece of the whole sum. And so the limit of the series is defined to be the limit of the partial sums, which sometimes that has a limit, sometimes it doesn't. All right. Uh, I want to do an interesting example, though, uh, which, which has something to do with the monotone convergence theorem, and it's this. If I look at the sum, uh, n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, all right? When I turn this into a sequence of partial sums, so this, if you write it down like as the sum, the first term is 1, and then it's plus a uh, fourth, because the next term is 1 over 2 squared, then 1 over 3 squared, which is a ninth, then 1 over 4 squared, which is 1 over 16, etc., right? Does that actually converge to something? And if so, what? All right. Um, this actually is hard to deal with, but we can show that this converges using the monotone convergence sequence. Monotone convergence theorem. We'll show it converges using the monotone convergence theorem. All right. All you got to do is show that it is bounded and monotone. Um, and by it, I mean the sequence we're looking at the sequence of partial sums, right? Which starts with 1 and then 1 plus a fourth and then 1 plus a fourth plus a ninth, etc. All right, I'm going to call this SN just 
just so we have a name for it. S for sum, the partial sums. All right? So we need, in order to show this convergence, we have to show it's monotone and that it's bounded. One of those things is easy and one is hard. Uh, does this thing seem obviously monotone to anyone? That means either increasing or decreasing. And does it seem obviously bounded? No, I see the, the nods for the monotone. Yeah, this is increasing every time, you can tell. Every time it just gets a little bit bigger. So Fn is increasing, that's the easy part. So it's monotone, right? Bounded is harder. But I will show you. There's a trick. Where's my trick here? Check it out. All right. Uh, in general, Fn looks like, so I'm, I'm about to show you the trick that shows that it's bounded. Uh, Sn, in general, looks like um, 1 plus 1 over uh, 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 4 squared, etc., up to 1 over n squared, right? That's, that's what the nth term of the partial sums looks like. Uh, I'm going to, here's a weird trick which you would never think of and I always forget, which is why I'm, I'm reading it off of my paper. I am familiar with this trick, but I can never remember exactly how it goes. I'm going to write them like this first. All those squares I just write as, you know, one thing times another thing. But then I am going to do a less than and keep the one like it is, but all the other ones I'm going to decrease one of the numbers in the denominator. So I'm going to write this as 1 over 2 times 1, 1 over 3 times 2, 1 over 1 over n times n minus 1, right? Okay? You agree? That is that is greater. And then here's it's just one weird trick after another. One over two times one, I'm gonna write as one over one minus one half. One this this here is one half, which is the same as one minus a half. You you with me? Yeah, it is. Okay, and then one over three times two, I'm gonna write this is the weird part. This actually works. Each of these terms, this is one sixth, which is equal to one half minus one third. If you do the common denominator thing, this really is how these fractions add up. And the last one is one over n minus, uh, sorry, one over n minus one comes first, the smaller denominator first, minus one over n, like that. All right, this is the weird step which I can never remember the details of, but it is, it is true. Anybody see what happens now in this sequence? Actually, you can simplify that. Don't try to actually re-manipulate the fraction. It's still good. Once you see it, it's, it's uh, not so complicated. Yeah? Yeah, all the cancels, all the fractions on the inside cancel because I got a minus a half and then a plus a half. Here I have a minus a third, but the next one starts with a plus a third. All of the fractions cancel, including this one, cancels with the previous, but not that one. All right, and not the first. I, I sort of have two leftover ones at the beginning, plus everything else cancels. And then I get minus one over n at the end. All right, that's the trick. So, Fn is less than two minus one over n. And then, what is, does, um, remember the whole thing? I'm trying to show that this is bounded. Is that bounded? 
Is there like a specific number that's bigger than all of those? Yeah, can you tell me the number? Show me with the fingers. Two, yeah, this is less than two. So Sn is bounded by that insane trick. All right, anyway, it's monotone. And now we also know it's bounded, which means that it converges. All right, so Fn converges. So this sum, which is what we were really concerned with, this, this exists. Like it actually equals a, a specific number. It doesn't go to infinity or anything like that. All right. This, like I said, the the interesting thing about the monotone convergence theorem is it lets you show that some limit exists, even if you don't know what it is. Anybody happen to know what the num what the value is that it adds up to? Would you believe me if I said it adds up to three or something? Like that's what I'm saying. It really does add up to something. Specific. Now, there's no reason to think that it should add up to three. Um, anybody seen this before? This is truly insane what this actually does add up to. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not something that we, we can get into right now, but I'll just tell you, if you're curious, actually, uh, this sum, n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n squared equals pi squared over 6. Eh? You knew I was going to say that? <laughs> so this is an example where I would say you have no hope of showing by hand that the limit equals that because there's no reason for you to think that it would ever equal that, right? But using the monotone convergence theorem, you can show just that it that it converges. The monotone convergence doesn't tell you what that number is. It it is a fact that that it equals that number. All right, very very strange, strange but true fact. I believe this was discovered by Euler. Um, that, that that adds up to pi squared over 6. Euler, Euler was into this kind of thing, these sums, like with, with different exponents down here. You get a lot of that, a lot of that business. All right. Great. We didn't skip over it. That was what I was thinking about skipping over. Any thoughts about that? Pi squared over 6 is a, is a uh, very interesting number. Let's then this number actually uh, also appears as here's an interesting thing you can talk to your talk to your friends about pi squared is something like it's around nine this this number is like slightly more than one if you look at the um, the reciprocal of that six over pi squared this comes up um, if you choose two numbers at random two like natural numbers chosen at random and ask what's the probability that they have a common factor. Um, have you ever thought about that before? This is something you could you could ask yourself. The answer is this this number. This is a, it's the probability that two randomly chosen numbers have a common factor. This is um, yeah, it's some it's close. It's kind of close to two thirds, but uh, it's not too big. All right, let's, um, let's talk about something a little different. So that, that was a little far out, I suppose, but the monotone convergence theorem can be used to show that something converges even if you don't know what it converges to. That's, that's what's interesting about that. Um, the next bit of uh, the next sort of section, we got 10 minutes, so we can give a little introduction here. I wanna talk about subsequences. Subsequences are important things, and they are the idea I think is natural enough. Um, a subsequence, the idea is you start with a sequence, which is a bunch of stuff. You can consider a subsequence, which is just like only some of those things. Uh, it's just like a subset, right? Um, a subsequence of some sequence is, uh, I mean, it is more or less just what you think it is. That is, it's another sequence. Remember, every sequence still has to be like infinitely long. So um, a subsequence is not like you only take two of the numbers or something. It's you still take infinitely many of those numbers from the original sequence, but you don't take all of them. You only take some of them. So a subsequence of some sequence 
It's very confusing when you try to write this down. The idea is very simple. You're going to see the notation is really, uh, is really cumbersome, unfortunately. That's how it has to be. A subsequence of subsequence is a sequence obtained by omitting some value. Omitting, I'll say, some terms, terms. All right. But you got to keep them in the same order. You know, the sequence has an ordering to it. There's infinitely many numbers in there in a particular order. And when you form a subsequence, you must maintain the same order. So it is a sequence obtained by omitting some terms, I'll just say parenthetically, in the same order. In the original order, right? That's what a subsequence is. So, for example, if I start with, let's say, a n is the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, ma, ma, ma. Uh, then here are some subsequences. There are many. There are infinitely many subsequences you could choose here. Uh, you could choose just, say, the even numbers 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. That's a subsequence of the sequence of natural numbers. All right. Or you could choose something like this, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. These are the prime numbers, right? That's a subsequence. Here are some examples of not subsequences. Um, like 2, 1, 4, 3, 5, 6, 7, etc. That's not a subsequence because I'm I mussed around with the ordering. All right, that does not count as a subsequence because I mixed around with ordering. Or here's another thing which is not a subsequence: one, one, two, two, three, three. Here I'm doing the same numbers in the same order, but I repeated some of them. That also is not allowed. All right, these do not count as subsequences because I either messed around the order or I messed around, you know, something else. All right. It's a little complicated. I want to give the, the true definition of a subsequence. It's going to look a little crazy. Unfortunately, it cannot be sanitized any better than, um, than what I'm about to say. So here's the true definition of a, of a subsequence. So let a n be a sequence. What I'm going to choose is I'm just going to choose some of those numbers, not all of them, just some of them. And a subsequence is just some kind of specification of which of those things am I going to take. Maybe I'm going to take the first one, the third one, the fifth one. Just You have to just describe which of them am I going to take. So I let a n be a sequence and the thing is you need another sequence. I'm going to choose another sequence sequence which is strictly increasing be a strictly increasing sequence of uh, I'll say ends remember when I define what a subsequence is it amounts to choosing specific values of n in order that I'm going to include so this sequence here is a sequence, uh, you imagine this as a sequence of numbers which are deciding which specific ones here. And this I'm going to call, call it n sub k, right? This n1, n2, n3, this I'm going to write as n sub k. And then a subsequence of a n is a sequence of the form, you know, a n one followed by a n two. It is you only choose those ones and you leave out the rest. And the way we typically write this as a n k. It's a double subscript. Is how you have to write a um, a subsequence. You decide which terms you're going to choose, and then you use only those, AM1 followed by AM2 followed by AM3, and if you want to write that as a sequence, it's just A sub N sub K. 
very weird, but like I said, there's no, unfortunately, no real way to get around this. So, for example, if uh, a n is the sequence one, two, three, etc., and my um, and let's say I want um, terms. How about I want to take the terms which are multiples of five? Right. Then the way to the way to like technically construct this is I would say let n sub k equal I suppose five k right if you want to write it that way or you could write it out it's five ten fifteen twenty right and then a sub n sub k is the uh, terms number five ten. 15 from a n, right? So that's 5. This is how you write a subsequence. Now, in this case, maybe this isn't a, a great example because here a sub n sub k actually is 5, 10, 15, etc. Right? It involves choosing another sequence of the indices, and from that other sequence, you build your subsequence. Probably you felt like you understood what a subsequence was 10 minutes ago, and now you're less certain. It's, it's one of those things which the basic idea of it is very intuitively clear, and probably whatever you were feeling 10 minutes ago is actually, is actually valid. I'm not trying to invalidate your feelings. But when you, when you actually write down the details of the definition, it, it seems to be much more confusing than it really is. But um, this is not just because I am a, I'm a confusing kind of guy. That this is how it has to be done. We got two more minutes. Can I just tell you the um, the most basic and important theorem about subsequences? It says if a n converges to a and a n k is a subsequence. Then, anyone want to guess what I'm going to say here? If the big sequence converges to something and I consider only some of those terms, I'm going to say... Yes, the, the smaller one, if you take only some of them, that also converges. And uh, what does it converge to? Yeah, it also converges to the same number. This is true. You might worry about, couldn't I choose a subsequence? I choose like only those terms which are like smaller than what the, the, the big one converges to. Uh, you can't make them smaller forever. Remember the subsequence has to be infinitely long. And so eventually, if you're taking a subsequence, those terms have to converge to whatever the original thing. So I'm gonna say then, A and K also converges to A, right? If a sequence converges, then all subsequences also converge to the same value. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this next time.